I'm standing quite high above a cove, which I'm going to walk down to in a moment. Beautiful um, island of Tenerife, the south side of, uh, of the island of Tenerife. Playing you back some of my, uh, so, some of the most precious moments that I think we've had on the programme. How on earth do you pick those? We'll come to that la later on. But let me make a sketchbook picture to start the, uh, to start the show today. I've got my faithful X100V, why, of course, with me, that I bought from mpb.com. Let's go for ISO 400, and what have we got? Uh, 160, F4, here we go. There we go, to, to start the day, a sketchbook picture. Today on the photo walk. I would talk about Sally Mann and Eve Arnold and the, you know, just all these people that have been inspirational to me. And she's like, I swear you will be, you, you will be able to take a decent image. And she got me a camera. And the other thing was that the fire split on two fronts and was burning in two different directions and, and kept changing direction based on the wind patterns. The, the experience of photography for me isn't sitting behind my computer. For some people, the experience of photography is the computer bit. So the, there's no there's no wrong or right. So this was now complete and utter chaos. It was really, really a challenging time. So my husband was in an induced coma and they didn't have much hope that he would survive. And you're very aware that people are watching because they tell you and there's a certain amount of jealousy that goes along with that. So you, t you, st you start to suffer these... Uh, people talking about you behind your back and saying not very nice things and it's it's a real strain on your mental health sometimes. I think sometimes as photographers we have a difficulty relinquishing control and letting go. I feel most present when I am taking pictures. Some people go to these uh, war zones or go and cover particular stories and at the forefront of their mind is World Press Photo or Pulitzer Awards and to me I have a real issue with that. The, uh, the second of uh, these seven life-changing chat editions. Two in a row, the uh, magnificent seven for this special are Miss Anne Harriman, a photojournalist, a fashion photographer, editorial photographer, humanitarian photographer, and uh, a story that starts with his, uh, his wife in many ways, her sheer belief in him and the stories that he could tell with a camera. Also today, the firefighting photographer Cam Neville, the pictures editor who learned quiet, Paul Sanders. Elke Vogelsang, with a real out of adversity comes creativity story. The former police officer, now landscape photographer and YouTuber, Adam Karnach. Nancy Borowick, with the personal story that I've never forgotten since recording it. And uh, Carl McNaughton, the, the photojournalist. It's the photo walk. You and I making some pictures with our cameras or smartphones, sketchbooking our walk together. Not so much sketchbooking from me today. Um, and it's the second of our summer holidays specials. Seven creative, life-changing chats. But why seven, I'm hearing you say? Well, in many cultures around the world, just in case you missed last week, seven is an incredibly important and lucky number. My mum used to swear by the number seven, as I did say last week. But if you do need more proof, why seven? Consider this. The big bestseller, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, didn't start with the number six, or indeed eight. Seven was quite ample. And I'm no betting man, but if, uh, I, if I was at a slot machine and three sevens came up, ah, great night out, I'd say. And for those in the UK who remember him, although I think he was on, was he on the American Strictly for a, for a little while? Our Len. The late Len Goodman, who, uh, who was famous for holding up his paddle and announcing seven. Before we start, though, a mention for our good friends at MPB. Oh, <laughs> I almost went for a bit of a... We'll start that again, shall we? Edit that out, Neil. You almost fell over the stones. They're very stony beaches in Tenerife. Black beaches, they are. Um, it's uh, oh, a lot of it is vol volcanic all the way around the island, the beaches, isn't it? Anyway, before we start, a mention for our friends, I'll stand still, at mpb.com, a website where you can safely, he says, underlining the letter S, 
buy, sell and trade used camera gear online are part of the circular economy. If you're buying, you get peace of mind. That's because you get a six-month guarantee on what you buy. And not everybody or not every site that sells gear online offers something as important as that, do they? No, he says, raising his eyebrow. Also, if you're trading or selling, MPB will send a courier to your house on a day that you say. And uh, once it's arrived with your gear back at their warehouse and they've gone through the checks to say it is as you say it is, um, and it's been properly graded through the website, then you get paid quick smart, which is really important. MPB.com is a very easy to use website. And if you want to buy, sell or trade used camera gear, then uh, it's a place I trust and uh, I, I thoroughly recommend it. MPB.com and we'll leave a link on the, the website today. Right, shall we walk? <laughs> he says carefully. Checklist out, coffee. No, actually, on this occasion, I am travelling light, but there is plenty of coffee back at the apartment. I shall be looking forward to it. Garibaldi's? Absolutely not. I did look. Nothing in either of the supermarkets I went to. Nada. Is that the right word? Nothing, anyway. Walking shoes, well, yes, check. One out of three <laughs> isn't bad. Let's walk. The photo walk. Today, there are no letters, just me popping up with a microphone along this path that I'm walking, introducing my magnificent seven for part two of this uh, holiday series. Here's the first of those. Uh, Miss Anne Harriman. Now, I spoke with Miss Anne over two years ago now. Part of our conversation was about becoming the first black photographer to shoot the cover for British Vogue. It only took 104 years of their history. Um, he began photographing in 2017, and this part of the story fascinates me because it's his wife and her absolute belief in him that started his photographic journey, even though he had had a camera earlier on. In his life, it was it was really that pivotal moment in 2017 when his wife said, "Well, here we here we go. Here's a camera. You can do it, Miss Anne." That the story really starts. His photographs: Stormzy, Rihanna, Tom Cruise, to name but a few uh, celebs. In six years, he has had quite the adventure. But what did I learn by uh, speaking with him? The the joy of self belief, because he is entirely self taught. And uh, whilst our longer discussion did enter the subject of in imposter syndrome, et cetera, et cetera, the, the pleasure of talking to somebody who embraces the can-do attitude was a real lesson to me. Two words, you can. There are two ways to win the internet. One is with extremism and the other is with empathy. A truism, if ever there were one. The opening words on the agency website, what we see, with the extra E, of course. It's, um, it's a shame it's become something we have to win, I think. But tell me about the, the agency, because that came before the photography, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we see is really born out of um, concern. Concern for, for what I call the, the weaponization of mediocrity. So... Uh, the, the information superhighway is a gift and a curse. And I refuse to accept that so much content that was detrimental to our mental health was becoming the content that we were being forced to consume. Because I, in general, I do not believe people have bad taste. I believe people don't have time and they end up just being lazy. And, you know, when you're scrolling that thumb and something just pops up that is, is, is viral cack, uh, they end up just consuming it. So I wanted to have um, a safe place for people that were drowning in the noise of the internet to enjoy the best of art, culture, music, just highly curated content that shows the very best of the human condition. Who was curating that? You were initially, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it grew very fast. And now we have a whole team of uh, curators globally. You know, some of them I've actually never met. This is the thing I, I love about finding a tribe of like-minded people that yeah. think the optionality in what you consume shouldn't be for the privileged few. Um, you know, I always say you need two things to enjoy what we see. A 
an internet connection and an inquisitive mind. So it was still me. I still curate um, a big part of it because I feel you just doesn't matter what happens, what lofty heights my life takes me to. I need to to still understand what people are, are looking for and consuming online. And give me an idea of the, the kind of stories um, that at the moment you're curating to appear within the site and on the site. Well, we do our own projects as well. So an interesting one is Feelings of Injustice, which we did um, for three months over the, the summer period. And um, it, it was um, my imagery. Um, so going out photographing civil rights movements uh, across the UK and then um, writing a narrative um, about what image of, of injustice makes you feel, you know, whether it's hope, whether it's empathy, whether it's fear. And it had an extraordinary response. And we actually took over the whole of Piccadilly Circus with it, um, <laughs> you know, and, and the good people at Ocean Outdoor and Lansec, who run Piccadilly Cir Circus, uh, gave us, and I mean the whole thing, every wow. single light up there um, wow. to put that, wow. that vis visual project up there. So that's the kind of thing what we see, uh, kind of trouble we, we get up to. <laughs> and of course, over the last four years, without wishing to get too political about it, but over the last four years, it's, it's, there's been a, a reasonable amount of discourse in the, in the media um, caused by oh, just, just generally making the, the internet not a safe place to be around. Mm. Is it a, a mirror of mankind? Yes and no. Um, yes, we do horrible things. But I do think that algorithmically, there is a lot of content that is at the top of our news feeds or easily available to a lot of young and vulnerable minds mm. that, that frankly speaking should not be and um we do not you know people like you and i do not control what instagram and facebook puts into you know into the news feed so i i just felt powerless and wanted wanted to find a way to to help people that were lost in, mm. within that um, Miss Anne, of all, all the, the great achievements, and we'll come to those, I, I guess the, the first great achievement with, the, with any photographer is vision. Mm. Um, you're self-taught, uh, reasonably fresh still in terms of how long you've been doing it professionally. Mm. Mm. Tell me what you believe photography would bring to you, and maybe you to it. I'm really dyslexic, and I uh, always struggled in the classroom, but I was decent at visualizing things. And I was the kid that was obsessed to a possibly unhealthy level in film and music and imagery. Always, always the, the boy that would have the keys to the video club or go to blockbusters in those days and, and pick films for people to watch, all, all of that sort of thing. Blockbusters, remember those days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I miss those days. I miss, you know, one film, one choice everyone sits down yeah. not on their phones and actually consumes some art yeah uh, um so i was always that kid and it was my wife that uh said you know just over three years ago now that look the way you curate images the, the images you show all your friends at dinner party you know i would talk about sally mann and eve arnold and the, you know just all these people that have been inspirational to me and she's like i swear you'll be you you will be able to take a decent image and she got me a camera and I didn't know what to do with it at all. I had had cameras in the past, and they were like gym memberships, right? You know, I kind of bought <laughs> some compact thing online and, and had, it had a flash on it, and I'll take it to a party and yeah. never use it again. Yeah. Um, so that was my relationship with cameras. But um, she got me a Fuji X100F. Uh, we were going to India. Right. Um, we were going to India that December, and um, I just took the worst pictures on that trip. Mm. You know, everything was overexposed, and I just did not know what I was doing. When I got back, I was like, what a waste. You've had a trip of a lifetime, and look at the pictures. So I, I got on, on YouTube, and the thing I love about the internet, and YouTube in particular, is that there are plenty of middle-aged men and women that have the same problems as me, and they sit in their garages or wherever, and they, they post videos saying, oh, I figured out shutter speed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what this ISO thing is, and and you know all of those things. I didn't even I didn't know anything, and I and and I found this collective of lost souls online that had figured bits out, and I love that because they weren't you know Pulitzer, you know they 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 weren't big deals. They were just regular civilians that were just trying to 
learn how to take images. And the other thing I've always done is I'm obsessed with the history of photography. Right, okay. So my mind has been consuming yeah, images yeah. since I, uh, for as long as I can remember. And I'm obsessed with light. You know, my favorite film is Barry Lyndon by Kubrick, you know, yeah. and that's just a, an opus of light. It is, um, yeah. So, so I think the combination of all, the amount of imagery that have been, has been inside my head, my ability to process things very fast, just visually, allowed me to, to pick things up. And the truth is you shoot who you love. I had a baby and I just kept shooting and I was shooting my little, mm. my firstborn daughter all the time and my wife and the images got better. I had the advantage, I think, of being able to see one of those prints behind you on the wall. Our dear listeners <laughs> don't. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> Was it a was it a steep curve? I mean, you say you say you're able to to sort of learn quite quickly, but it is quite a steep curve if you really want to do it, you know, properly, isn't it? Um, if you don't know how, how far you have to go, you kind of just just. Uh, I I enjoyed the moment, right? I um I struggle with an- anxiety and um, imposter syndrome, and mm. one of the ways I've been dealing with it in my adult life really is to try and live in the moment of whatever I'm afraid of. Yeah. So. If I'm out, I remember when I first shot someone that was halfway, you know, kind of famous. I just felt so free when it actually started. When the shoot, I was nervous getting there. Yeah. And I was worried I would embarrass myself. But when the shoot started, I I felt uh, like I was supposed to be there. I didn't feel like I was an imposter. Mm. And I think that's a, a big part of anxiety is that it's the build up. That, that gets you mm. you know it's the thinking about the failure that gets you when the moment arises it's it, it can be easier to handle I, I know you're very proud of the black photographers that have covered history and activism before you and it feel, feels like you've been handed that mantle of responsibility and do you do you feel that at all i, I know i saw a wonderful film where charlie phillips who you're greatly oh. inspired by he he sent you a personal message and uh, i think you kept you kept it together reasonably well i think as you were being delivered that message but, but there is there is a responsibility that um, that seems to be being handed on, and I th- I think you're taking that with you now, and your job now is to inspire others, isn't it? It is, and look, socioeconomics is just a fact of life, and Charlie was born in the wrong time. His talent was not, you know, was not, and and it's not even finger pointing. A black photographer taking the sort of images that Charlie w- was taking, and they're, they're they're priceless to me now. Mm, I think that mm. his archive is should be part of the English National Archive. But um, in in the days that he was doing it, he would never have had a chance. Fleet Street would have, you know, they would just laughed at him, you know. And I see the scars and the open wounds this man, in the latter years of his life, has. My only thing is that it was so amazing to, whilst, you know, he's, he's very much with us, he, he could have that celebration of his life with The One Show, which is one of the wa- most watched TV shows in this country. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I, off the back of that, he's been getting a ton of people wanting to buy prints and support him. And, and, and that really, we can't change the past, but we can recognize what was wrong with it and make the present better. So the future would mean that people with that on godly talent that Charlie has um, will always get what they deserve. I am not about handouts to people. Uh, I, I'm about if you're talented, doesn't matter whether you're man, woman, what what race, what religion, if you're talented, yes. you, you, de- you deserve yeah. to, your work to, to, to climb the heights that it should. It should. What a pleasure to talk with Miss Anne Harriman. I, I am trying to get him back onto the show. There's so much more to cover the last couple of years. Um, it's, pr- it's proving tricky to get him to answer any of my messages. I have a feeling that the email address I had a few years ago is probably not the right one now. He lives very locally to me, actually, so I've, I've offered that we go for a, a, an actual walk and talk. I think that would be fascinating. I'd love to talk with Miss Anne about the, the last couple of years and, um, and that, I know it's a very overused word, but journey, it is a journey that uh, he's had. Right, second guest of uh, our Magnificent Seven, wildfires. Now, it's a pertinent subject at the moment around the world for um, all kinds of horrific reasons. Um, As the news dictates today, the number is 850 missing in uh, in Maui. And so that's that's a horrific number. And I'm acutely aware that um, tourists who are still arriving on Maui 
have been asked to stay away from the island. And as I flew into Tenerife, we were two days into wildfires that were in the mountain region, the tidy region, the volcanic tidy region of the of the island and um yeah, it's part of me thinking oh it's this this feels is it inappropriate obviously i'm completely aware of the importance of tourism to the country and and the fires it seems were started uh, purposefully here that's what the news is in the local newspapers so if if that's the case and of course as i say news changes fast and regularly um, that would be just completely just ridiculous honestly but they seem to be receding we have had some firefighters that have been staying in our in our hotel and they seemed a lot chirpier uh, yesterday i don't understand a word of what they were saying um but they they seemed more content um in themselves so the cloud that we had as well that brought ash across the island that seems to have dissipated by quite some amount, so much so that today I can't really see it on the mountains behind us. So that's good news as well. Cam Neville is a, is a photojournalist based in Australia, and I was first introduced to his work photographing the firefighters of Australia battling wild bushfires. Um, I was introduced to him in 2020. I thought a lot about him and his work over the, the past month particularly the the last couple of days with the uh, the appalling loss of lives and properties and wildlife forests livelihoods the the work of firefighters is nothing short of incredible because there are times those on the ground just can't escape themselves as we found out when i was talking to cam and in australia the firefighters well in the main that are that are fighting these bushfires they're all volunteers and the the equipment is is far from perfect a local resident cam volunteered to to fight the bushfires himself and it didn't take long before being a photographer uh, that he he found that he was also photographing the brave firefighters and the ecological disasters that unfolded before his eyes what did i learn from cam oh I mean, the the whole episode really is one to be listened to again, but it's integrity, it's honesty. Uh, It's the the purest form of an understanding that the service you can bring and share as a photographer is something really very special. Here's my second guest, it's Cam Neville. It's been an organic process of, I, I don't think I really had a great idea about what I was doing at the time. You know, it, it, I just knew it was something uh, valid that would be very interesting if I could get to the front lines. But to be honest, you know, I had no idea where the journey was going and it, you know, it terrified me, I think, that first fire I saw and I, I honestly thought, what are you doing here? But over time, that seems to have dissipated and I think, I, you know, it's been almost a decade now I've been shooting that project. It's a never-ending project as well, really, isn't it? Well, I think so. I mean... Look, they talk about viewer fatigue as well, so I, I don't know. I, I, I've been going through, a, you know, sort of more dark period in, in my, uh, shall we talk about my mental state over the last sort of six to eight months, yeah. uh, thinking a lot about that and, and, you know, its validity. You know, I'm not sure how valid it is and what it's, con- you know, what am I con- contributing towards photojournalism or documentary photography you know other than making these startling pictures but after a time i'm wondering if it's you know like a flicker book where you know everything's just going to look the same um but to me you see you know it's funny i was in my house the other day thinking about this interview and then i was thinking about the last time we talked and i remember you asked me a question about you know am, am i risk averse um, you know, because we talked about Don That's McCullen right. and yeah, how, yeah. you know, he never, you know, he didn't really think about what he was doing until afterwards. And, you know, I was recently shooting a hazard reduction burn and I remember hearing trees coming down and I was walking around. They, You know, I've got to the point with this project now where they're inviting me to go and shoot, which is an amazing situation to be mm-hmm. in. You know, and I, I went to this burn and, uh, you know, I'm wandering up through the forest and, um, you know, I'm hearing trees come down, but I'm finding myself walking into these areas that I know are dangerous, you know, and, and things have happened to people recently where trucks have been crushed by trees and, you know, and I'm thinking, you're crazy. Like, wh- what are you doing here? Like, you know, yeah, yeah. this is this is the picture worth it? And then, you know, you come home and, 
uh, from that particular burn. I think you've seen the photo. I, I got a photo, another amazing photo of a firefighter walking through with his drip torch, and it just made everything worthwhile. But I don't know if you'd be saying that if you ended up in hospital. No. <laughs> you know, it's like. Well, you did send me a you did send me a message. I hope you don't mind me quoting a private message you sent me this weekend. I was back shooting an HR burn. I think it's the one you're talking about. Actually, and it felt good. Um, that that was the intriguing bit, and it felt good. Although I am starting to feel my nerves are going from the constant exposure to danger. Yeah, that's uh, and that's certainly you know been a dark path. I think over the last sort of eight or nine months is uh, I, I think uh, you know I've, I've felt that. I think after Black Summer last year and that, that exposure we had day after day after day to fires and more fires and just being permanently have adrenaline running through you was, um, you know, starting to, my mind was starting to sort of fray a little bit in areas. And I, I think that's inevitable, I think, with you have exposure to those kind of situations, yeah. but you, you have to try and understand, A, why you're there and B, what you're doing. And, and if that becomes, if you can't answer that question, then I, I think it's time to stop. It seems to me that the, the, it's changed a little bit. The, the, if you uh, pardon the use of the word, the focus of, of, of it has changed slightly. And in that, when we spoke last time, you were definitely for you were definitely firefighter first, photographer second. Although now you, you're saying that they're inviting you to go shoot, which we, I don't think they were doing last year. Um, so is it is it swa- no. is it swapping a bit? Are you becoming? if you like, the photographic wing of, of the, the fire service now? Well, you know, it's in, there's been interesting developments and, you know, because we, we talked a lot about, you know, I, I felt the project is very strong. I think the images are very strong and it's certainly, you know, been received um, in that manner by a lot of people. Um, but I, I think now when, oh, you know, they say, oh, there's that guy, the guy that shoots all the fire photographs. So, yeah, it has. You know, a lot of things have changed and I, I think the focus shifted and it's interesting that you ask that and it's very perceptive of you because, as you know, I, I tend to mull things over quite a bit, you know, do, doing my everyday things, driving in the car, going to the supermarket. I'm constantly processing these things and I, I think it definitely has shifted. Um, I had some contact with the Queensland Fire and Emergency uh, Media Department who uh, have been using my images since... Uh, since the Canungra fire last year you know and I, I don't mind you know I get access to things and therefore I, I feel it's a fair fair trade to be able to go and and do these things and so I've been invited to a few things now to specifically to shoot and so there has been some shift in focus whether they uh, you know there was a bit of resistance to this at the beginning I feel from them but I think because you know I've been at it for so long you know everybody in the service knows me now it takes a lot of pressure off me as well because, you know, I do feel that when, you know, you, you go in the truck, that's that's what you're doing. You're yeah. a firefighter. Yeah. Whereas now, because the focus has shifted a little bit, I have been allowed to turn up and and um, photograph and just function on that level. And therefore, I, you know, the recent has a reduction burn. I mean, I, I normally go out with the mindset of getting one really good image. And I, I came back with about half a dozen, which was a really good day. I know. Yeah. So. Last year, the fire that shook everyone was the, uh, the Sarabar complex fire. And that's Black Summer, isn't it? It started the end of August, wasn't officially extinguished till Christmas Eve. Uh, that's the best part f- of four gruelling months. How, how did it grab hold that badly that the most proficient of forces in the world had such a battle? Well, we were we were in unprecedented conditions um, at, at that stage. Um, I recently uh, watched uh, an interview with Mike Wassing, who's the uh, Deputy Commissioner, and he was talking about the fact that we, we had best practices in place and we were, you know, we were trying to suppress the fire and the conditions just didn't allow for it. Uh, that particular fire had got into um, rainforest area and talking to people that know about, you know, Australian ancient rainforests, you know, they don't burn. They just don't burn. It's, there's yeah. too much moisture. Yeah. You know, that kind of vegetation is doesn't burn and it burns. And it burned ferociously. I remember going in a, an Australian rainforest when I visited, and I can't imagine, um, with all the moisture that you're talking about, how it could. 
Yeah, I mean, it, and you know, that was the thing. It was people just couldn't understand why the rain, why is the rainforest burning? You know, no one could get their head around it. And the other thing was that the fire split on two fronts and was burning in two different directions and, and kept changing direction based on the wind patterns. I mean, we just had a period of weather that was allowing for this incredibly sort of ferocious fire behavior. Um, and normally with, with fires like that, you know, a lot of time is spent on mapping the fire and, uh, you know, that'll be via helicopter and they'll map the fire front and where it's going. And from that, normally they can work out a plan to what's called pinch it out. So they'll force it into a gully. They'll force it into somewhere where it can't burn anymore. Um, but it just wasn't possible. You mentioned to me um, in, a, in a message as well that there's a feature film being made about Black Summer. Are, are, are you going? to be involved in that uh look i was involved um some time ago um in initial talks but nothing's actually happened since right, okay. then so i don't know i suspect that somewhere down the track somebody's going to make a documentary about it um as they did with the black saturday fires back in 2009 um there was a documentary on that it's on youtube if people want to check it out it's fairly humbling watching those things to realize mm -hmm. the enormity of what's happening and it, it's not just happening in one place it's you know it's happening all over the place I remember from last summer the pictures of folks literally escaping to the water's edge to escape the fires as they as they burned towards them. I mean, that was what was the what's the reaction of the Australian people being like to the climate and the fires? I mean, you're, you're a resilient bunch, you Australians. Yeah, we are. But I think, you know, it really shook everybody and particularly the amount of animals that suffered. You know, um, we are animal lovers here and people didn't want to see our native wildlife burn. I mean, watching. You know, I can hardly talk about it now, but watching pictures of koalas, you know, with steam coming off them from the heat yeah, of the fires coming yeah. out of the bush was, it's just, no. it's absolutely horrific. You know, I can look at a house burning down and think, yeah, well, that can be rebuilt. It's bricks and mortar. No one was in there. No one's dead. You know, but when you're watching wildlife suffering and, and, and right, and, and I mean, you know, I, I saw that firsthand when I was at a fire uh, north of uh, Brisbane um, last year. You know, we found a baby koala in, in, in the bush, you know, in the burnout area. Um, luckily, it was okay, um, but we don't know what happened to the mother. Uh, and, you know, you're just hearing these cries coming from the animals. It's, uh, But, yeah, look, I, I think um, we are resilient, um, but that really did shake people. I mean, there's images, as you've seen, of, of people being evacuated off the beaches onto boats. There's uh, There was incredibly heroic things. I mean, there's videos on YouTube. You can see, you know, people protecting their homes as the fire comes racing up the hill. For a lot of people around the world, it's, you know, it's such a foreign notion to have to go out with a hose. I mean, it's like you standing outside your house and, having to protect it with a hose and yeah. a rake and watching this fire come down your street and burn every house down in your street. But it is part of our landscape and it's something, you know, we need to talk about and we do need to talk about how the climate's affecting these fires now. And they, fire seasons in Queensland, you know, even since I started uh, nearly 10 years ago, have changed. You know, last year's fires here were unprecedented. They hadn't seen anything like that for nearly 50 years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's it's going to get worse. There will be a lull in this, you know, in the fire behaviour uh, for a while, but it will come back and there will be fires in places that they haven't had fires before. And it's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. And we know that because of what's happening in California right now as well. And the thing is, you know, it's still, you know, we talk, I talked about validating my work. And I think that's the important point is those images still need to be out there. People still need to see them because we need to be reminded to take some action on, you know, how we're living. Never a truer sentiment spoken. And my thanks to, to Cam Neville. Um, for uh, well, for his, his work as a firefighter, of course, and the fact that he puts his life on the line to protect his family and um, his local community, and then for the incredible photo stories that he's making, which are really, really important, I believe, and will continue to be, especially now, particularly now, as, uh, as we move forward and, uh, and think more about what we're doing to this planet. I can't believe that people would start fires purposefully. It's just, it beggars belief, doesn't it? Right, my, my third conversation in this second of two specials is uh, Paul Sanders. Now, the former pictures editor for The Times 
um, looking at 20,000 images every single day, found that the, uh, the associated responsibilities left him with stress and depression, insomnia and anxiety. I would imagine anybody who has to edit and oversee the pictures and send people out on, uh, on assignment and quite dangerous assignment, very dangerous assignments at times. That must be an extremely um, anxious job and shoes that you have to fill every single day. But um, he rediscovered himself when he left that job. And in episode 43, he shared a story of, of how it all came to a head. But this part of the conversation that I've decided to share is, uh, is about Discover Still. The photography that he, he now does, the photography that is about calm, it's about well-being, it's about mental health. Uh, this part of the conversation is about Discover Still. And what I've learned um, continually following uh, my discussions with him, because I've had a few, and this is a, a long while ago, this is probably the first conversation I had with him, is the power of quiet and the power of, uh, of immersion in nature, something that money simply cannot buy. But it is our most precious gift, isn't it, as photographers, to be able to, or walkers or hikers, to be able to walk with our, our cameras and make pictures of the, uh, the fabulous scenes that we see before us. This is, this is Paul Sanders. Your pictures are very minimalist. Um, how long do you take to find and, and make a composition? I'm, I'm assuming you, you're no longer driving around in quite that, maybe I'm using a clumsy expression here, but crazed manner that you once were. <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, I now only photograph in, um, let's say, far away locations or drive to locations. When I'm doing workshops or talks nearby, most of the stuff I shoot now is is very close to home, sometimes in the garden we're very lucky that we live out in the countryside um i've got some woods opposite the house which i love and we're 40 minutes from the kent coast so occasionally i'll wander down there or down to the sussex coast um but i don't you know i don't need to drive anywhere i i now fully appreciate beauty is actually everywhere you know you don't need to travel to a well photographed location to take a, a, a picture that works for you you know, I'd taken my home area for granted for so long. Thing, you know, a bit like you live in London, you never go and visit anything in London. <laughs> um, it's only when you move out of London, you then go and visit everything in London because all of a sudden it's not on your doorstep. I, I would deliberately ignore Kent a lot of the time, but I'm so lucky to live here. Yeah, we don't have mountains and massive waterfalls, but it's a different kind of beauty. And I think when you start as a photographer, you tend to put too much into your pictures. You overdo the information. Um, and I just started simplifying and simplifying and simplifying because my head was complicated enough. It was noisy enough. Um, there was so much going on. I was so distracted by everything that the simpler my pictures, the more I could understand what was coming out. That just started to work as um, almost as a style, but it I, I had to be very careful because you know, people put you in boxes very quickly, you know, so people will always say, oh, you, do, you just do long exposure um, or you just do landscape. Uh, and I'm not one thing or another. I'm just a photographer. I'm happy behind the lens with a person in front of me of interest. And it has to be an interesting person, not just a random person, but an interesting person, whether it's a building or a landscape or the sea or a lake or a tree or a gate or a flower, um, you know, I mean, last week I was photographing the scraps of paper that came off my book, um, you know, when, when we trimmed it. Um, <laughs> and it, it's just being able to look at something and go, do you know what, I really like that. And that's where my photography is. It's, I really like that. You know, I think that whatever that is, is beautiful or interesting to me. I don't give two hoots, really. And not in an arrogant way as to where other people like what I shoot or not and you know it does sound a bit arrogant when you say I don't care what people think but I don't but it's not through arrogance it's through self-concern self-healing if you like because the only person that my pictures have to please is me yeah. um, and that's where often we lose sight because we're always thinking you know if you're in a camera club oh I hope the judge likes it or I hope the other members like it yeah. you know yeah. 
if you're doing qualification, then the, the committee's got to like it. Um, if it's going in for an exhibition, you want other people to like it. You know, you're putting it on Facebook or Instagram. It's, it's nice to get that validation. Um, you know, and I'm I'm very lucky. I, I've got a, a lovely group of followers on Instagram and Facebook and, uh, you know, of my newsletter and things like that. Um, and they're really supportive. But if I had no people following me on any social media, I would still take the same photographs that I do um, because they're important to me. And I enjoy the moment that I'm taking them. So every every stage of my kind of development into whatever photographer people want to say I am is basically a journey of self-discovery and self-expression that sort of sums it up really i don't know whether that's the answer you were looking no, for I, I, well, I think if you start to wear other people's opinions as well you're, you're straight back to square one as, as well paul aren't you really and i think you made the right decision in that respect it, it's nice to have your work liked but if you don't like it if you're not shooting true to yourself you might get people saying your work is it's nice um you know that they like it but it will always feel a bit empty to you. Yeah. People talk a lot about getting it right in camera, but your approach isn't just simply a, an exposure exercise or long exposure exercise, as you've, you've now identified as well. You use filters and, and an array of those to achieve your signature look. Can you take me through that yeah. process? Yeah. I mean, the, the whole getting it right in camera thing, I like to get it as close to right as I can. I mean, it's, it's impossible to, to not do anything in Lightroom or Photoshop. So... I don't want people thinking I'm some kind of amazingly gifted photographer that can turn sow's ears into silk purses <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> using a film simulation. It doesn't quite work like that. But what I do is I, I mean, for the long exposures, I, I use Lee neutral density filters and I've got everything in my bag from a two stop up to a 15 stop. And I will combine those um, in whatever sandwich is necessary and i also use graduated filters a lot now i i could do it in lightroom i'm sure but i like producing as close to the effect i want in camera and then using lightroom and photoshop to enhance rather than using lightroom and photoshop to make the picture i'm assuming as well these are drop-in filters rather than screw-on yeah. filters yeah i am not a fan of the the screw-on filter because they they limit the creativity that you can have a slide-in filter you know you can put it anywhere and angle it at any point yes. um you know so it's your decision rather than the manufacturer's decision as to where the grad falls which is why i've always supported lee i think their filters are great um i like the team at lee filters they've always been very supportive of my work and they're british made which is very important mm. to me um but the whole idea of it is that i use those filters to create something in the viewfinder that reflects how i'm feeling about what the landscape is saying to me and that's the important thing, so that when I get back, I can look at the file and go, right, this is where I was going. And all I need to do now is add a bit of contrast or, you know, lessen the contrast off or just bring the blacks down a tiny bit. Because I don't want to spend a lot of time behind my computer, you know, which is odd at the moment, seeing as I spent more time behind my computer now in a day than I used to when I was at the Times. Um, but for me, the joy of photography is being outside with the wind in my face and the mm. rain kind of bashing on my waterproofs and you know, that experience, the the experience of photography for me isn't sitting behind my computer. For some people, the experience of photography is the computer bit. So the, there's no there's no wrong or right. Um, it's just what suits you. And I think whatever suits you, go with. I don't think, you know, getting it right in camera should be held up as a sort of a benchmark, just as I think, you know, shooting without any filters or um, exposure control should be held up as a benchmark. I, I think every person has an individual approach that works for them. And if you try to do it in the way that other people do, you won't be happy. You've got to find your own mm -hmm. your own way of doing it. And my way of doing it is I get it close as close to right as I can, and then I tweak it. Um, I don't shoot to the right and get as much information as I can on the sensor because that's not the way I work. I just let it sit where it sits. You know, so often my files are very much stacked towards the black end, which means I've got very little information to work with. So therefore, I don't work the files too hard. But if I'm teaching photography, I would always teach people that the more information they get on the sensor, the better image they will get. Because I don't want to just make people clones of me. I mm. want them to be able to work out what they want and then throw the stuff away that is irrelevant to them. 
You know, and I think that's a very important thing that when you're helping people with their photography, you don't turn them into you. You know, as I found, Joe Cornish is the best Joe Cornish on the market. Yes. Um, you know, and I know Joe often says that people do Joe Cornish better than he does. There are there are people out there who take who go to locations that I've photographed and photograph them in a similar style to me, but photograph them in a much better way. But I never look at them and think, oh, I wish I'd done it like that. Because I did it the way I did it at a certain moment based on how I was feeling and a certain set of weather conditions that will never be repeated. I don't worry about it. I will show people exactly where I went and exactly how I shot if that's what they really want. That standing in the rain thing that you talk about, there's a, uh, yeah. um, a lot of the images look like they're taken through mist and, and that is because of this long exposure. Oh, wow. and, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe you just go looking for the mist, but maybe you do. Yeah, yeah. But but photographing through the rain obviously can, can create that sort of image as well, can't it? Yes, it, it does. Um, you know, especially if it's heavy rain and you're shooting into the light a little bit, you, you do get a slightly misty, softer look. I like that. Um, I love working with the rain, you know, so you, you're shooting through the rain, but I always try and make sure the rain's at my back so it's not blowing onto the lens yeah, or, you know, yeah. I've got a big umbrella, um, I've got good waterproofs. I love being out in the rain. I think it's really exciting. I think yeah. photography can, well, it is a very solitary occupation. These yeah. beautiful images that you create, they, they can make me, this in a good way, I want you to understand this, Paul, make me feel quite alone in the places that you show. Like I'm tr <laughs> truly stuck in a moment. Uh, and I, I know that's partly how landscape works. You kind of teleport somebody into the scene, but you also especially so because they're completely serene and that has to be purposeful. Yeah, I, I rarely, rarely like my landscapes to have people in. I like to feel like I'm the only person there that I'm the only person experiencing that moment. And I, I believe that when you're really connected to the landscape, the moment of beauty is just for you. Even if there are other photographers around, they'll be at a slightly different angle, so they'll see it differently. Um, their moment will be different. So, you know, I purposefully don't really like people in my pictures. I've included them a couple of times for scale, but I've ne it's never really never really done it for me um so i like the landscape to be just the landscape just how it is and allow people who are viewing the pictures the freedom to interpret it in their own ways you know so their own sense of scale or you know questioning of, of scale and i want you know like you said i want people to feel that when they look at the pictures they're the only people looking at them um you know or in them i think viewing photographs should be as immersive in some ways as as the taking and I, I think you only get that when you stand in front of a, a, a print or you hold a print. Well, I want, I want to come to the tactile nature of the print element of your work in a second, but I yeah. can't believe it's taken this long to, to ask you this question through this interview. But um, why black and white? Why not colour? Colour irritates me. I find colour distracting. I liken it to having my arm rubbed with a cheese grater. <laughs> my goodness. Um, <laughs> I look at colour pictures and I can really appreciate their beauty, but... When I look at a landscape, I don't see the colour. I see tone, I see texture, you know, I see pattern, I see rhythm, I see lines. I don't see the colours. It just doesn't do it for me. Mm. I've always had a fascination with black and white. I mean, I started, you know, my first photographs were on black and white film. Um, I worked in a black and white dark room. My love of black and white, it, it goes all the way back to me starting in photography. And I like the simplicity of it. And I think in some ways... Colour, for me, when I was going through my real mental health battle, colour was just more noise added to a situation. Um, it was more distraction. And I like the strength in black and white, but I like the subtlety. I like how clean it can be. And I sometimes find with colour that people just jack the colours up to make a picture look good. And, uh, you know, if you listen to people and they say the reaction to the picture is, God, the colours are amazing. That's not the photograph is brilliant. That's the colours are amazing. Mm. I think when people look at the colour over the content, that's really sad. And there are some amazing people who do colour photography. You know, their work is, is mind blowing. But I just don't see that way. I, I see the world in shades of grey, often shades of dark grey um, or shades of, you know, tones of white. 
I use the color. This is the odd bit. I, uh, although I shoot black and white and color, I, I sh- you know, I'm quite old fashioned because I shoot JPEGs in black and white and my raw files are, obviously they come out They're color, really, but I yeah. use the color to allow me to express the tones in a picture. So like I'll often shoot with a, the red filter on to increase the intensity of, of blues or I'll alter it round to change the way a, a picture will, will look because I, I think, you know, in the old days, we used to use filters on black and white film because black and white film saw colour. Yes. Um, you know, so there's nothing wrong with using the colour information to produce the best black and white file that I can produce. And I, I think a lot of people forget that black and white actually is a, is, is a response to colour. So it's just a different way of seeing colour. You see it as tones mm. rather than colours. And my thanks to Paul Sanders. I shall leave a link to all those that you hear today on the uh, the show page so you can listen to the uh, the full editions. My, uh, my fourth chat in this second of our specials, my Magnificent Seven, is with the German photographer Elke Vogelsang, who specialises in pets. Well, now it's commercial photography of pets. For a while while she was establishing her business, it was pet photography for anybody that had a dime that would um, (laughs) pass it before Elka. Uh, But now it's commercial work. And if you go to her website, you'll see the most extraordinary photography of pets. It's uh, it's characterful, uh, there is no doubt. Her pictures are a declaration quote of love and gratitude to dogs. Three Spanish rescues in particular who joined her family and saved, actually, Elka's husband's life and changed, as she says, our whole lives for the better. It was one of their dogs barking that called Elka to the bathroom in the story you're about to hear, just for some, uh, some context. What have I learned from Elka? Do what you love. Be guided by it. This is Elka Vogelsang. When did you begin making pictures of of dogs and cats? Yeah, I started photography as a hobby in the analog days already, Um, but I just snapped away and documented. Once in a while, I wanted to become a better photographer and shot a few films. And when I got back the results, I was not satisfied. And then I just, yeah, forgot about it for quite a while again. And I think it was um, 10 years ago now, My family and I had a quite stressful time with several sick family members. So we had taken on my mother-in-law with dementia. My mother-in-law was a lovely lady, but dementia is not so lovely. So that was in 2007. And um, two years into that time, my father died and my mother needed more help. So I had my mother-in-law to take care of and my mother. And so that was quite stressful and I had decided to um, start a one picture day project. I wanted to start that on January 1st, 2010. And on Christmas, so right before I wanted to start that one picture day project, I found my husband unconscious in the bathtub. Mm. And the diagnosis was a severe brain hemorrhage due Mm. to ruptured aneurysm. Oh my word. So this was now complete and utter chaos. It was really, really a challenging time. Um, So my husband was in an induced coma and they didn't have much hope that he would survive. And so I started this one picture day project to try to keep something, to to keep up something like normality Mm. at that time and to have something like a creative outlet because, well, it was just lots and lots of sick people to take care of, lots of worry. And yeah, the dogs had to be taken for a walk. So they were my models. My husband recovered fully, thankfully. He had no short-term memory at all for weeks or months. I also wrote a written diary for him, which is, in hindsight, very, very funny, actually, because he was not aware of his situation. And, yeah, he had no short-term memory at all. And some things were really, really funny, but Mm. only from a later perspective, not Mm. at that time. Well, it's interesting you use the word funny, because... You know, the first word that strikes me when I look at your homepage is humour, and simply that, humour. 
Um, you're obviously somebody who, even in those darkest moments, can find humour in things. But you, you found the character of your sitters. So in this case, <laughs> the the animals, you found their character through this humour. But but where do your ideas come from? I mean, do do you look at a dog and think, ah, do you know what? I'm going to have that dog hold a rose in its mouth, or, or, or be licking sorbet from a tub, or be cuddling up to a lovely fluffy duck, looking like that toy is the, is the only friend in the world. Where do your ideas come from? Um, yeah, humour and German. That doesn't really go well together. Oh, I, I guess. wasn't saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my husband, for example, is very, very funny and um, we laugh a lot here. And I think dogs are very funny. And um, at that time, when I did this one picture day project, the first pictures I took when my husband was in the hospital were dark and moody and not funny at all. Mm. So the funny pictures came later on because I think dogs are very, very funny. I had to come up with a new idea every day and I put the pictures on the internet. I showed them in a blog and I didn't want to bore the people, the one or two followers I had, I don't know, um, with the same ideas over and over again. So I had to come up with something new every day. And that's that's the great thing about your story is that you started out really small, no followers, <laughs> and you've built this, this whole thing as been brick by brick by brick and it's that yeah. it's that organic thing this is this is a story Elka I try and get across to our kids I always say to them look you can't just one day wake up with a hundred thousand subscribers you can't just one day wake up with five thousand followers you have to build it and that's been what your business has been about isn't it yes in 2000, let's say seven, eight, nine, whatever, I sat in front of my computer and I admired the pictures of other people and I was absolutely convinced that they have talent and I haven't got any talent. Interesting. And I will never be able to produce such nice pictures. And nothing happened overnight for me. I just kept on taking pictures all the time and I keep repeating myself in many, many areas. I shoot dogs all the time, so I keep taking pictures of dogs and do the same in that perspective but also I have the same topic in a way and I keep repeating myself but I enjoy it very much but that also improves my eye for detail yeah and yeah the specialization in dogs this um, taking pictures all the time. I take a lot of pictures which are really crap, but because I just keep on taking pictures once in a while, <laughs> they are better. In terms of lighting, I'm imagining the bright colours, these big pictures, you're, you're using quite a lot of strobe, yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so how does yeah. the setup work there? Because uh, um, I'm always intrigued by how um, different animals, and we'll talk about cats in a while, but different animals react to this explosion of light. How do you find that with dogs? When a dog is um, scared by the strobe, it's usually not because of the light, but the sound. So I don't really dial in a very high um, power. And I have only one strobe. I have two strobes, but I use only one on dogs because I had a very important large commercial project. I think it was two years ago and I had to shoot lots and lots of different dogs and cats and all with the same light and the dogs came from all over the place from different owners and I had to make sure that the dogs are all lit the same way and that all dogs are okay with the light so for that project I used only one strobe to be on the safe side and actually it works perfectly well to use only one it's not very inventive my light is really flat and I like when the fur of the dog is evenly lit that, so that's what I like. Um, of course, you can be more experimental and creative with lots of different lights, but then you ha also have to have a cool dog um, that's fine with uh, three strobes firing from different directions. Most dogs will do perfectly, but some might get scared. And so you reduce the risk of the dog getting scared by only using one strobe. And But I also use reflectors to the sides of the dog and also one under the chin if needed. And, and, and the strobe you're using, is that a studio strobe or is it a speed light or what What kind of kit is that? I don't know how to, you pronounce it, Jinbai, Jinbei. It's capable of high-speed synchronisation, which I find very, very handy with dogs. Mm -hmm. Now, you're a big fan of complementary backdrop colours, big colour spaces behind the dogs. I mean, firstly, do you, do you have a large studio space or, is, or do you travel with your lighting to different places to work? I have a studio place in my hut 
in my house okay. and it's around i think 30 square meters oh it's good space then and it's definitely enough for dogs, mm. not for horses. No, no. <laughs> when I photograph <laughs> horses, I go out to the stables. Now, you've so many magazine covers that feature your work, Elka. When, when did that all start clicking into place? People such as Times Magazine, th those sort of organisations. Suddenly, suddenly people thought, have you seen what Elka's doing? It started in 2014 when... Um, I, I wrote um, articles for websites. Whenever somebody asked me if I could write an article or just um, in a short interview, no matter how many followers that blog had, I always put the extra effort in and wrote a piece for them. And sometimes you think nothing comes back, but once in a while something comes back. I was on holidays and I got an email from a website owner who asked me if they could feature my pictures and I was yeah on holidays and I just said well yes of course thank you very much just <laughs> choose the pictures you like and from my 500 px page yeah. because I'm on holidays I can't send you anything and in those days I was still an outdoor photographer and I f thought that studio photography was really really boring yeah I just had uh, pictures of dogs in mind bored dogs on cardboards that was studio photography for me so from the very beginning i tried to come up with something more interesting and th those were these funny shots yeah. and this website decided to take the studio pictures and what i didn't know was that that website was huge that had i don't know loads and loads of followers that was bored panda and so they featured my pictures and all these studio pictures and the pictures went viral massively. Yeah, so all of a sudden I was the studio photographer and that's, yeah, when I decided to specialize in studio photography and more and more and more websites featured those pictures. And yeah, that's when the magazine started contacting me. You can actually, everybody can write an article on Board Panda, for example. There are lots and lots of websites out there which feature um, photography projects. If you've got a nice picture series with some text, you can send it in, for example, to My Modern Met or This is Colossal. And when they feature it, you have a lot of attention for your pictures. You might have a lot of attention. That's a very, very good tip. Elke Vogelsang, and I'll make sure I, I leave links to Elke's work and, of course, all those that we speak to on today's programme. Ah, it's, uh, you could probably hear the, the rumble of Tenerife now coming alive. It's about an hour and a half, maybe hour and three quarters since I, uh, I started my, my walk uh, to record these, these links between our guests. And I seem to have wandered quite away, actually. I find myself between two villages. There's, um, there's a sort of scrub land between the two villages, which leads to the airport. So if you hear some aircraft, don't be surprised. But uh, on my left here is Sam Blass. Oh, I know Sam Blass, Neil. It's the one with a really nice tapas place. Oh, that's the one. You do know it. And then as I turn 180, there's a fishing village. Quite a cutesy fishing village, actually. The buildings step down uh, along the, the, the volcanic um, rock. They step down into, into the sea. I might go and explore that later. I've not been um, making my photographs as we walk today, my sketchbookers, but I have been photographing. Perhaps I'll include some on the show page. I didn't do it last week. I didn't think it was that kind of show, these specials, but maybe I'll leave a few. Or, or perhaps save them for a postcard. Ah, that's maybe the better way to do it, as, as, as a postcard within the postcard feature that I will run, by the way, into, into autumn. Um, <laughs> And possibly beyond, because I'm beginning to get quite a few, which I love. Keep sending them in, please. Send your pictures to stories at photowalk.show. 2,500 pixels wide, if you can. They do work better, as I've had a couple of portrait postcards, and you can buy portrait postcards. You can buy them in all manner of shapes and sizes, I know, but the landscape ones work really quite well. Really quite well? Work really well. Where's your English nil uh, for, the, for the show page? Right, fifth conversation. This one is with Adam Carnach from First Man Photography, a former police officer who uh, in his career has witnessed all kinds of depravity and cruelty, such as the 7-7 the seven -seven bombings, which happened when he was a police officer in London. But he's also witnessed, as he says, the most extraordinary acts of kindness and bravery and heroism. But... Um, when policing changed, uh, down to budget cuts and various other factors, 
uh, Adam decided to leave the force, which he'd served with for many decades. And he took a real, a real leap of faith to become a, a photographer and a filmmaker. Um, his love of the wilds through his films is absolutely palpable. It really is. And I think what I cherished most about our chat uh, is his straightforward talking about being a YouTuber. This, this chat had me thinking about the courage you need in a world of thumbs up and thumbs down in social mediaville. It's something that many of us, maybe all of us, have, uh, have come across with uh, our work at times. And that's the reason, well, not the only reason, it's one of the reasons for, um, for including Adam in, uh, in my lineup today. Here's Adam Karnach. Why did you start the channel, though? What, what, was the, what was the purpose behind it? Yeah, I mean, we talked about being an introvert or an extrovert. And I always thought I, w I was the sort of person who didn't particularly like attention. And I still feel like that to some extent. But as the years have gone by, talking about being self-aware and questioning yourself, my actions seem to suggest otherwise. Uh, and I I've become... I've got to the stage now where I enjoy talking to people about photography, whether it's on camera or on a podcast like this. Uh, and it, it, it's definitely made my photography better. But I started the channel partly because I wanted to share some of the knowledge that I'd developed over the years. But I, I, it wasn't selfless. I wanted to promote myself. I wanted to grow uh, my audience for my photography. That was initially why I did it. I wanted to get more jobs basically and, and push myself as a photographer. And then as it developed into doing the landscape vlogs, it's become so ingrained now with my photography that I find it difficult now to separate it because if I go out to take a landscape photograph, I might as well film it. And, and doing the vlogs has driven me to get out to do landscape photography more often than I probably otherwise would have done because I've got a weekly schedule on YouTube. And it's just, I mean, it was it was strange because I, I filmed a couple of test runs of videos. So I got the, I, and I was always fairly comfortable with the camera. So I got that up. I knew I needed video lighting. So I bought some video lighting. I set the camera up. I thought about the, the composition of the shots. I thought about the tutorial I was going to deliver. And then on that very first time I clicked record, on that camera and I'm staring down this lens and I thought, ah, oh, uh, what do I do? I've got to actually say something now. And it's got to be coherent and concise and something that people are actually going to watch. So yeah, as, as the, as the years went by and I started putting the videos out, people started to watch and come back and make comments saying that they enjoyed the videos and, and it just grew from there. And I remember getting my, first hundred subscribers and that was a, a huge huge moment we, when you think about like if you think about 100 people in a room that's a lot of people that's a very good point actually because i think people sometimes get lost in this well i've, I've got to get this many subs or this many views when <clears throat> in actual fact if you looked out at, at an audience of three 100 or 300 or 600 which, which for many youtubers would look at that as kind of oh I only got 600 views 600 people in a room watching you would be a frightening experience i think yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's just, uh, I've been struggling with it recently, in, in all honesty, because the pandemic probably hasn't helped. I didn't put out as many videos and I actually enjoyed the break because as the channel grows and you're very aware that people are watching because they tell you and there's a certain amount of jealousy that goes along with that. So you, t you, st you start to suffer these uh, people talking about you behind your back and saying not very nice things. And it's it's a real strain on your mental health sometimes because it also it's also a very, a very lonely existence because friends and family don't understand the things you're going through. And the only real, I mean, you need to find peers and that, and really that's other YouTubers. It's this, it's a very strange existence where you, you're this one man production team publishing it as well and then you get the comments back and sometimes that's difficult and I've been try I've been remaking it I let it get to me sometimes and I don't know why I've been talking to my wife about this recently because when people make a little comment that is 
maybe a bit mean or a bit troll-like. I really take it to heart and I don't understand why. Because in real life, if someone does that, I couldn't care less. Like, I really don't, I really don't, in real life, I really don't care what people think. And of course, with your police background as well, you'd have thought, well, a- Adam of all people is going to have this proper thick skin. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in real life I do. Because I, 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 I believe I'm a, a pretty nice guy. So I, when, when you see that in real life, you kind of think, well, you're wrong. You're just, that's unfair. Like you're shouting at me and there's no reason for it. But on online, when it's in, in, in black and white, in written form, it feels like it takes on this other power because it's, it's there as a record then. But also you don't know who you're talking. You don't know who it is talking to you or trying to engage you. And a lot of the time it's just some bitter, grumpy people behind a keyboard who really, who really just need our pity rather than rather than anything else. Uh, I think Sean Tucker, um, the YouTuber, summed that up very well when he said, you know, you'll never find a talented troll. That's very true. That is very true. And it's nice sometimes because people jump to your, like other viewers will jump to my, uh, or they'll have my back, as it were, which is quite nice. But over the last few months, particularly, I think I've got much better at almost trying to disassociate from that. Talking of the pressure, is there there a a pressure to feed the machine? I mean, I know you said you've not done as many of late. Isn't that funny? Because I was thinking, Adam's been doing so much of late. I've seen it from the other, I've seen it the other way. I mean, the last couple of months has been better. But in, in, in the in the height of lockdown, sort of April April May time, I didn't put as many out because I just couldn't create them because I was looking after my kids all the time. And equally, a lot of us weren't even allowed really to go further than half an hour from our front door either. Exactly. So, yeah, that was. About, yes, there there is definitely a, a there is a need to feed that YouTube machine, and I, there are times when I get frustrated with YouTube as a platform. I don't want it to sound like I'm complaining because that platform exists in a way that lets me reach all these all these great people who watch the videos, but it feels a lot of the time like you are playing a game where you don't know the rules. Uh, and that's been something I've struggled with a lot. Like you see, you see other people doing videos that do really well and you can't quite understand why. I will produce a video that does really well. I don't really understand why, so I'll try and replicate something similar and then 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 that one does really badly in terms of views and in the youtube game views equal money on the whole youtube is not doesn't earn me money the amount of money i've invested especially if you count my time the amount of money i've invested into these youtube videos are nowhere near what i get back in terms of advertising revenue but it's an overall eco and i'm now trying to see it as part of the overall ecosystem which your marketing tool uh, isn't it really exactly but i don't want my connection to the the viewers to be that i'm not that's not why i'm creating the video this i'm not creating the videos purely to push myself in terms of marketing I think one of the things that's very key to being a police officer in, in criminal law is intent. It's always, it's, it has a big effect on criminal law. And I think intent's an important thing for going into YouTube. So what do you want? I think if you're thinking of starting a channel, you've got to think about what do I want to get out of this? And also then provide more value than you get in return. And that if you do that, it will be become more credible. Like there's a lot of channels and I think in the gaming world this is quite prominent where some of these youtubers don't care about their audience one bit they're just doing it to make some money or promote themselves and and i certainly don't want to be like that the primary concern for me is to create content that the audience will enjoy and so I've, i've been feeling these certain levels of frustration over the years and i wanted as time has gone on i wanted to do less educational stuff, direct educational stuff on YouTube, because A, I don't think that benefits a channel anymore. If you just do some random, excellent tutorial, a lot of people might see it through search and things, but then it won't necessarily mean that they become a long-term viewer and someone that you can connect with. And that I'm looking to grow an audience that is good quality. And it's people that believe in what I'm doing and they trying to find a core audience rather than a broad one that don't really care uh, and i think transitioning some way away from doing tutorials on there was something i needed to do for me because there's also there's only so many times you can teach a particular thing so i, I needed to find something more sustainable so i've done a few videos about the, a few more philosophical videos if you like 
that talk about this connection between life and photography. And then I do do the vlogs, which kind of show uh, an adventure story, basically, of trying to find this shot. And one of the videos I did recently, I was hunting for this quite special tree in North Yorkshire, and it it was essentially a quest story. Like, uh, and it and it did end up following that arc and that's I want to be producing entertainment inspiring content around photography rather than just the transactional information and tutorial type stuff well there's no doubt in my mind that moments like that come across completely genuinely and authentically for you Adam and I, I thought it'd be good to take a listen to the the absolute joy you demonstrate about your photography at moments like the one you describe this is it this is the moment I've been waiting for. I'm so excited right now because it's all paid off. All that hard work, all that effort to get here has paid off and the weather couldn't be much better for this particular shot. I've got that golden hour light and then behind this fantastic, this fantastically beautiful tree, the weather is a little bit worse, but what that's doing is it's acting as an addition to the image really because the tree now has some separation because of that hill fog. The mountain in the distance is under that cloud and there's mist and mood behind it, but it's still gonna be a beautiful, warm image. This is what landscape photography does for me. It just makes me feel so good. If I was here by myself, I would not be getting this excited, but I'm just letting those feelings out to share it with you because I want you to experience this. This is what being out in the landscape, out in nature, is all about. I'm completely by myself, other than having the company of some sheep over there. It's just me, the tree, the view behind, and my trusty camera. You're a very natural communicator. When I when I watch one of your films, he does it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like you're scripting it. It feels like it naturally flows. And that goes back to what you were just saying. You wouldn't want to make it look too easy because I'm sure it isn't quite as easy as that. Yeah, so the, it depends on the type of video I do. Some of the more philosophical ones where the, essentially just pieces to camera, they, they will have a plot outline. Not script as such, but there'll be a very a relatively stringent outline of what I want to talk about because my mind generally wanders in lots of different directions, so I'm not quite as concise as it might seem on those videos. But then again, the vlogs are totally unscripted. So all the things I'm saying on those vlogs are as it happened. And as I'm out in the landscape, talking about the landscape, or talking about an amazing moment with the light, they're all real moments that I, do, I, I generally do it in one take. If I, so there'd be an odd occasion where I'll do a second take and I'll always end up just using the first take because it's usually more genuine and better. And even, even if I've stumbled over a word, it, the feel of it still is better than the second take, which is word perfect, but it doesn't quite have the feeling. And I think that's the key to those vlogs is that it's like people say it to me all the time that we, I feel like I'm there with you. And I, that's a really nice, really nice comment to get. And my thanks to uh, to Adam Carnach. I'm back on the beach. You be careful, Neil. Last time you did that, you fell ass over to it, as my grandmother used to say. Very surprising for my grandmother, <laughs> that kind of language. You might be thinking, and I, it, it certainly uh, was something I was thinking about uh, as I was selecting my guests. You might be thinking, well, Neil, of of the hundreds of guests you've had, and some very famous ones as well, how on earth have you chosen them? Um, with difficulty. I did go quite a way back into the, uh, into the archive to start with, because I thought revisiting that made, made sense. But certainly this, this sort of magnificent seven format, as it were, I'm going to revisit at other holiday periods as well. So if you think there's some guests that are, <laughs> are definitely missing, they will be here at some stage in a, in a future edition of, uh, of, of this program. Right. Sixth inspirational chat is with Nancy Borowick, a photographer, a speaker, an author, a teacher. Her book, The Family Imprint, is one of the most uh, precious and important books that I have. It's difficult to read, mind. Um, it's all about documenting the last years of her parents' lives as they fought cancer together. Um, it's the most extraordinary work for its sincere courage and its personal record, really 
Although I've, um, I've chosen to play you some shade and light from that story. What did I learn, though? Because it's a long episode, this, and it's worth visiting to hear in its entirety. Um, I think, you know, this is a moment where I realised what you and I have as photographers, and for me, uh, an interviewer, um, this permission that we have, this unofficial license to be curious, is a really, really precious gift. I knew it before then, but I think things like this, moments like this, conversations like this, with really special humans, never mind photographers, um, really, and I'll use this word again, un underlines the sincere privilege that we have as documentary uh, makers, as storytellers, you and I, you with your camera, me with my microphone and camera. This is Nancy Borowick. I, I didn't have the courage to make pictures of my mother years ago when she dealt with her end of life illness. And I wasn't a photographer when my father passed. But I, I wonder now if having talked to photographers like yourself, I wonder now whether I'd have seen how important this, this could have been. Are you ever asked by people how to go about doing this? Do they say, Nancy, tell me how to do this? All the time. People ask me all the time. A lot of photographers have said, I couldn't have done this yeah. the way that you did. And I say, well, I couldn't have either. I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I didn't, I think that I was sort of in the right place at the right time. I had been working professionally. I was comfortable with my camera and, and being in uncomfortable situations. And I wasn't, I wasn't intentionally telling this story. I was just in it and and reacting to what was happening. When people do ask, uh, for example, a friend of a friend, I get a lot of friends of friends yes, yeah. contacting me yeah. saying they thought this would be okay. And, and I welcome all contact because I feel like once, like you, once you've lived through this kind of loss, you, you sort of have this wealth of knowledge and experience that... Um, you can really help other people going through what they're going through. And uh, so a friend of a friend contacted me and said, my mother is dying and I'm trying to process this. And I, I'm terrified and, and of all these things. I don't know how many days we have left, but I'm not a photographer. I'm not a writer. How do I hold on to her? And, you know, I wasn't prepared for that, but I was just sort of speaking from the heart. And I said, I said, one, I'm really, I'm grateful that you did think of, about this component, you know, like that you want to do something because mm. the reality is, is that once someone's gone, someone's gone mm. and the stories are gone and their voice is gone and all those things as difficult as it, as that is. So I said, you know what, my advice would be, you know, you have your phone with you, just start recording, just start recording your conversations. Right. Um, make notes. I hate the way that I write. So I just made bullet point notes because I wanted to remember the funny, you know, off kilter things that happened. I wanted to remember those moments where, um, you know, like talking to the nurse about like, does my mother really you know, like the funny, weird jokes that happen or, or the fact that um, uh, the fact that I'm pretty sure my grandmother was trying to set my friends up with other people, like at my, at my parents shivas like the the <laughs> funny those little things like yeah. i was like just record yeah don't think about it just record um and she was like she felt a little awkward about it but then she was like you know what i'm gonna do it and then i heard from her months later and she said you know my mom passed away and i'm so grateful that you that you brought that to my attention because i did record and while she wasn't entirely in her in her right mind during that time there were so many funny things that happened and I get to hold on to that. I get to keep that forever, yeah. which is what I love about photography and, and, and really all mediums that where you can capture information permanently because, you know, once the moment's gone, the moment's gone. I don't know. The other thing is that I'm, I'm a bit of a hoarder. <laughs> I'm a collector. <laughs> I, I desperately want to hold on to all the things I possibly can. And, um, do you know, I've heard photography uh, described as many, <laughs> or photographers as described as many things, but yeah, maybe we are. I've never heard it. I thought of it that way. <laughs> maybe we are subconsciously hoarders. It's just, we're hoarders of imagery. We're hoarders of imagery and we have a tool to well, do that hoarding, well, yeah. you know, like we, and we have an excuse. Well, it's okay. I'm hoarding imagery, <laughs> and we have we have obsession, but that's yes. part of who we are, that's and that's part right. of you allowed like, it. it was you a, know, as a photographer, yeah. 
That sounds like the perfect excuse. Um, so you're, yeah. you're making this incredibly potent, very vulnerable story. And and then the New York Times say they'd like to carry it. Now, you're sharing this sort of very personal family story. You're, you're making the personal family story for yourself initially. It's not because you're thinking, well, I'm going to make a book out of this. Or uh, I know your father was very pleased to, to, to offer up his stories. But I'm, I, I shouldn't think that a publication was the forefront of your mind. Did your parents mind that or did they welcome that? I think they were... I know that they were surprised at the prospect of their very personal um, story becoming very public. But they said to me that if this was important to me and my career, then if this was a gift that they could give me kind of at this point, um, then what did they have to lose and what, and look at what they had to gain. And I don't think any of us could have, predicted or imagined um the reaction and how much we would get back uh as a result of sharing our personal story that was that was really overwhelming and i'm grateful that my parents got to experience some of that kind of reader engagement um before they died another thing that your mother and father got to experience was your marriage i like the story of you climbing the tree to to do some sort of marriage selfie you had to become your own wedding photographer well I, when we were planning the wedding people the first thing people would ask me was who is going to shoot your wedding and are you going to take pictures <laughs> yes. um i think they all expected me to say you know like i've hired someone i'm not going to shoot but yeah. they clearly those those people clearly didn't know me well enough um <laughs> no i i think sometimes as photographers we have a difficulty relinquishing control and letting go I feel most present when I am taking pictures. So, you know, those moments when like people are like, you know, why don't you just put your camera down and be in the moment? I'm like, I am in the moment. This is what helps me be in the moment. <laughs> Sometimes only photographers can understand I think so. and relate to that. I do. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so when it came to the wedding, I had been talking with the New York times and, and this seemed like a perfect sort of climax for the story. Uh, for the sake of the paper. And um, Jim Estrin, uh, who is a longtime staff photographer there, and he used to run the Lens blog, He's and has since become a mentor of mine, uh, was assigned actually to go to my wedding to shoot it for the paper, for the larger story. And I remember he said to me, I'm assigned to this story, but this is your story and you need to tell it. So how are you going to shoot your own wedding? <laughs> and I was like, okay, uh, let's think about this. So I, I, I had the plan of wearing a camera on my shoulder while I walked down the aisle. I jokingly thought maybe I'll, I'll wear a GoPro. <laughs> um, and the conclusion was how about I rig a camera above the hookah and I'll have a remote trigger in in my bouquet, yeah. which like oh, that's foolproof where, genius. It that, was so good. Oh, I didn't realize that was where the trigger was. Oh yes. Ah. Well, oh no no. So I, let me let me backtrack a moment. That's where the trigger was supposed to be. Ah. And uh, just before the wedding, um, I decided that you know what, I I set up the shot. It's mine my picture, my vision, but I, maybe for this moment, I'll relinquish the control and hand the remote off to a friend, my assistant, if you will. So uh, I didn't have the remote in my bouquet as I had planned, but I have to tell you that, so we had two cameras, one above the tree, uh, above the huppa in the tree, one on the ground, because yeah. obviously I had to get multiple angles. Oh, well, at one stage you're gonna walk underneath the huppa, aren't you? So you'll, you'll need that shot as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Everything was was synced up, yeah. and uh, my friend uh, Jessica Earnshaw, also a photographer, was triggering the remote for me. Um, so both cameras were firing, and even though the the camera above the hoopa was firing at nothing essentially because we were we were out of view, I could hear the shutter clicking, <laughs> the or the mirror clicking, <laughs> and um, it brought me a certain satisfaction that I cannot explain. (laughs) Like, I knew we were getting the shot. Please tell me that you were concentrating on your vows at the same time. I was. I'm I'm multitasking queen. Um, But it just, and I think, no, I don't think anyone could hear it other than me, but it was 
it was a, it was a little wedding gift. Uh, it was, I felt it, like it, 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 <laughs> there were some beautiful shots on that. Um, sadly, after the wedding, your father goes downhill uh, reasonably yes. quickly, and he does pass on the fortieth anniversary of. Um, his mum's passing. Again, there's some humour, though, isn't there? Because when you, when you you take this extraordinary picture, it's so courageous. I mean, I know he's just passed. It's a sad picture. But the story yeah. you tell of that moment is one of... Well, there's some humour because <laughs> the television's flickering on and off. Yes. Um, it was so insane. We were at the hospital and... Um, I mean, the hospital room had kind of become our home at this point. Yeah. And... There was a TV. We didn't really watch a ton of it, but I swear in the last like hours of his life, I don't know if it's you start hyper focusing in on the little things, um, but you know, like the sun was setting and that was really important to my father. He loved the sunset. It just, he felt this, this, this unbelievable connection and passion for the sunset. It's just a thing. Um, and the TV, the hospital TV. It was this little this little screen up by the ceiling kept turning on randomly. And it was turning on to football, which was like, he loved football. He loved football so much. He was buried in his favorite football jersey. And it was so, it kind of cut the tension. Yeah. You know, that moment where you're like, so like, is this really happening? I, I can't believe this is happening. Is it happening now? And then it like cuts to a broadcast of a football game and you're like, ah! <laughs> like, but then it felt so right. We're like, is he doing this somehow? Like some magical way? I don't know. It all just felt very meant to be. And my thanks to Nancy Borowick. And episode 194 tells the whole story of this incredible photographic and book project, The Family Imprint. I highly recommend, if you haven't heard it, to go and take a, a longer listen to, to that one. Right, my seventh, my seventh photographer. The final one, not the final, because as I said before, I, I, I know we're going to return to this idea in uh, future holiday editions. The Irish photojournalist, Carhill McNaughton, who has spent his life documenting stories in places and countries that are challenging with a capital C. What did I learn, though? What is, uh, why is this a life-changing chat for me? Well, it underlined that wonderful ability some photographers have to, uh, to just know their calling. I, I love this idea that everyone has something, something in their life, the one thing they need to do. I hope that makes sense. Because when that moment arrives and you let it in, it, uh, it creates the most extraordinary conditions from which to tell photo stories. So this is Pulitzer Prize winner, Carl McNaughton. It's quite an empowering thing to do, to uh, tell people's story or to, to be the voice of people that don't maybe have, have the opportunity or the, or the possibility to uh, share their story and let the world know what's happening. Because generally what I'm photographing is, it can be seen as quite uh, negative, negative things. And there are issues that need to be highlighted and dealt with by uh, people a greater force than me, but uh, I can be the sort of conduit for them to get their story out at times. I know your father had a real influence in you taking this path into photography. He was a, he was a very artistically practical man by all accounts, wasn't he? And he, he how important was that initially to you? As any photojournalist uh, knows, it's not it's not a career path that most people would be uh, encouraged to go on because you know it's not like a, a lawyer or an accountant or something. But uh, my father is, as you said, he's a uh, is a very artistic man. He's got a background in wood turning and wood carving, but he was always at something, you know, he was always at calligraphy or art. All his hobbies always surround, uh, around something that was uh, artistic. So uh, he he encouraged me whenever he seen that I had a, a love and a passion for uh, photography. It's not something he actually did. It's one of the few hobbies he, he never took up. You know what mm -hmm. some people's fathers and that are like, they're uh, at a different uh, hobby every few years, but it's something he never did. But he was always there encouraging me. And that, at no point, did he ever say, could you not get uh, something, maybe a more stable job or whatever? He was always right there behind me, supporting me through all the all the tough times, although he's he's still he's not too happy with the fact some of the places I go and some of the stories I cover, but I, I tend to keep a lot of that uh, 
a lot of that away from him. Now, Brendan Murphy, a very much acclaimed press photographer and, and then editor for the Irish News, he, he saw something in you, didn't he? He took, he took you under his wing. He was an enormous figure in photography during the Troubles. And there can't have been many better or more appropriate to have worked with. What was his advice to you and how, how did he help you along the road initially? He was the driving force be- behind me really at the start. He was my mentor, still is. And uh, Brendan was always there to give you uh, advice. Pretty harsh advice at times. He, he, didn't, uh, he didn't hold back. Uh, he was ex- extremely critical, but because I had so much uh, respect for the man and still do, it seems to have uh, stood me in good stead. So when I started, I started in the traditional route of cleaning the darkroom and uh, diving, diving the films. Uh, I remember the highlight of the start of my career was there was a wine column in the Irish News, the, the, the paper I worked for at the time. And it was every Thursday. So every uh, Wednesday, a photograph had to be taken uh, taken of a bottle of wine. <laughs> and I remember it was many, many months of watching this being done and diving other people's film of this wine that I was allowed to <laughs> graduate to photographing this wine bottle. And I remember the first time I did it, I was so excited and I made a complete mess of it, <laughs> which is quite funny looking back on it because... <laughs> Well, an an inanimate object in an office is pretty easy to photograph, yeah. but uh, I still made a mess of it. Uh, <laughs> so that, that was that was the start. So he kept me grounded at the beginning, and uh, but he helped me build uh, the foundations that my uh, my career and knowledge is uh, based on now. So he was a uh, he was a great influence on me. We're going to kind of fast forward through your career and uh, earning a place within an agency such as Reuters is, of course, a dream for many photojournalists and and then becoming chief photographer in India for the agency. How did the association with Reuters form? Well, uh, after working in London for uh, quite a while with a couple of different agents, well, I worked for the Press Association and then the Daily Telegraph, I moved back to Ireland and was given the the opportunity to become their uh, their photographer covering Ireland and wherever else they wanted to, to send me. And so after a period of a few years working there, then the the opening came up to uh, go to India, and I applied for it and got it, and uh, that's that's what saw me in Delhi for the next few years. Were you prepared for what lay ahead? I was I was warned or given advice before I before I went that nothing nothing would prepare you for India. There was no way you could be prepared for it, no matter how well traveled or how many different locations you had worked in around the world. And I didn't really think this was true until I got there, and then I realized just uh, how difficult it is. Just uh, waking up in the morning is a and uh, going about your day before you even take pictures can be an effort in India. You know that logistically and environmentally, India. Takes Takes a takes a toll on you without doing anything. If you're passive, you're still being assaulted by your senses and uh, mentally. So, yeah, India was a uh, was an amazing opportunity and one one which I really relished and loved. An amazing place to work. I spoke to a photojournalist um, earlier today about the fact I was chatting with you, and he said, uh, "Oh, he's he's the wire photographer you would want to be working for one of the biggest news organisations in the world. An inspiration, but also flies under the radar." Is, is that a fair description of how you operate, do you think? Yeah, well, I, I like to be quite uh, low-key. I'm not really one that uh, would hog the, the limelight too much, although now I'm because of the way things are moving on, I'm having to push myself forward and put myself into the... get on the people's radar. It's just the way things work. But yeah, I like to go about my business uh, quietly, there's a lot of people look for the praise and adulation and they, they thrive on it. Of course, I have an ego. I, I, I like any comments, I positive comments I can get, but I, I like to just uh, work away quietly and do my own thing and then let, let uh, my work uh, speak for itself really and uh, hopefully hopefully it does here's a word we use quite often actually Carl the de- democratization of phot- or phrase democratization of photography how has that affected you that the smartphones and and so on and so forth and everybody's a street journalist now well I've had to embrace it there's no uh, there's no point in uh, being a luddite about things and saying oh I wish it was uh, film photography and we were in the dark room that's that's just not the way things are are anymore technology is advancing the way people consume their media is is changing at at all times and you have to you have to go with it uh, you can sit by and complain but that's that's not going to change anything so i'm embracing it i've 
uh, joined Instagram and what have you, as you know, by yeah. uh, taking a wee look at some of my pictures on Instagram. And I, I photograph my or film my dog in my <laughs> van yeah. uh, like everybody else and photograph my food. So what can you do? Do you sit by and just say nothing or do you uh, jump on board and uh, try and change it from within? So that's that's the approach I'm taking. Well, one thing you've had to develop is is is, is, is providing more than simply the stills uh, because I know you think of yourself as a, a, a journalist, don't you? You have to interview as well as shoot. Video is more important than ever. Um, th- those additional skills are really important now, aren't they, in this business? Yeah, well, that's just part and parcel now. You, There's no such thing as a photographer as such. Any photographers I know, even working for the, the newspapers and the agencies, we are all journalists. People are wanting more for their money now. A lot of the agencies we're working for, uh, they want you to be able to be a journalist. They, they expect you to be able to shoot video as well. Uh, so it's something you have to embrace. And if you want to make a career of it, you have to do it. So so a really important part of your career, I mean, it's all, all, all been important, but this, this for particular reasons of late, the mass exodus of the Rohingyans from from Myanmar uh, became became news, and the world finally became conscious of it in 2017. Although I think it, I'm right to say the refugees have been fleeing from persecution a good few years before that. And I read you had a particular passion in this particular story. It was a story, and I'm going to quote you: "You fervently wanted to do." And I wonder why that was. There was just something that uh, that was drawing me to the story. You know, I think every photographer maybe has got an assignment that they find themselves drawn to in a particular period of their life that they feel they must cover. And I fought and asked to go and cover that until eventually they relented and let me go, let me go and shoot it. And when I was there and even subsequently, it's something I am very, very proud of that I went and I shot it and I did it justice, I think. I hope I did those people justice and helped highlight the plight to the rest of the world. And yeah, me and uh, my colleagues at the time, because I was part of a team, a very, a very good close-knit team at Reuters that uh, went and covered the uh, exodus with empathy. Sometimes you can go to these stories and it's just it can be almost like a box ticking exercise, which I know sounds terrible, but that's the reality. Whenever you're shooting assignments day to day, but this is something that was done with a lot of empathy and passion and uh, sympathy. So it's it's something I'm really really proud of, and I'll I'll be proud of it till uh, the end of my days. It was photographic coverage that saw you awarded quite. Right rightly with a Pulitzer Prize for, for photography in 2018. Did that did that come as a surprise? I mean, I know it's very much a team effort as well, and you're very quick to remind people that that it was a team that, that won this as much as anything. Well, it's always a surprise. Who, you know, if you were to think uh, or expect to win a Pulitzer Prize, I think you're going to, you're setting yourself up for a life of misery. You can say you've won the Pulitzer Prize, but I, you don't win a Pulitzer. I think you're you you know you're awarded the Pulitzer. It's not something that you want to hold up and celebrate some terrible plight that you've uh, highlighted. You know you it with uh, being awarded a Pulitzer comes a, a certain responsibility. So it was it was a great honor. But saying that there was other people that were sh- other people that were shortlisted with work that was every bit as important and photographs that were every bit as good as ours. It's just on the day our our team managed to be awarded the Pulitzer, and I'm I'm eternally eternally grateful yeah. for that. D- d- does it sit comfortably for those telling the stories to win prize prizes? I mean, you, you mentioned the word plight, you know, essentially winning prizes for pictures of plight. I mean, it, it's uncomfortable me asking, but it's something I've mused over because there's such juxtaposition, isn't there, Kyle? Yeah, and it's something I have a problem with as well. I didn't actually enter the Pulitzer. It was uh, we were. Uh, entered by uh, somebody else that was on on our behalf that's that's the thing i i can rest easy with this uh, particularly this particular accolade because i know i went and shot it with the right reason some people go to these uh, war zones or go and cover particular stories and at the forefront of their mind is world press photo or pulitzer awards and to me i have a real issue with that because you're really doing it for the wrong thing Photography isn't all about taking away. Some people go to a particular uh, assignment and all they do is take. 
You know, photographers, they're just taking things and they want to be awarded things. You've got to give something back. You know, you've got the reason we were there was to show the world what was happening. You know, there's plenty of people we know they shoot specifically for competitions. And that is a road to mental health problems. Mm. And uh, you're going to be sorely disappointed and you'll never be satisfied because you're never going to win competitions, every competition that you want to enter. And you're in it for the wrong reasons. Now, on the subject of empathy... I've asked photojournalists before about uh, empathy or separation in context of the camera being between you and your subject and, and how you deal with situations where your job is to is obviously to tell the story photographically. That's important. But y- you feel like you want to maybe down cameras and pitch into somehow help. And some of the pictures from Cox's Bazaar uh, spring to mind, images of the, the scuffles that you've made during the food distribution and mothers holding uh, newborn sick children. There, there's one image, uh, Carl, of a, a young child pulling him literally pulling himself through mud in your collection that just won't leave me and and what what about that that separation between telling a story and and wanting to physically pitch in is is it hard yes it can be difficult you know you hear photographers journalists saying well i have a job to do if you get too emotionally involved you can't do your job that's okay to an extent but i'm uh, a father i'm a son I'm a brother. I'm just like everybody else. So there were numerous occasions uh, in Cox's Bazaar when I did put my cameras down and I did help people, not because I'm uh, better than anybody else, but just because that was the right thing to do. I remember one incident where uh, myself and another uh, photographer from the Associated Press at the food distribution center, it was so chaotic and so badly managed that we uh, put our cameras down and started to take control of the situation ourselves and distribute the food ourselves otherwise it was going to turn into a complete riot situation that's when uh, you know humanity becomes more important than just a, a photograph you know you have to be when you close your night eyes at night you have to be able to sleep and live with yourself i always think of what would my mother think i know that that seems like a a very simplistic way of looking at it but what would my mother think if uh, if she knew that i was here and there's people suffering or whatever and i wasn't doing something to help and my thanks to Carhill McNaughton. And that's a good place to close for this, well, the second of our two specials. We will return with uh, more of this format at uh, other holiday times of the year. But um, with, all our, with all our shows, we have a playout song. If you're new-ish or you're new, new, new to the uh, photo world, we always have a playout song at the end. Something to, uh, well, think about what you've, uh, what you've heard. Um, on on today's show to to think more about what you've heard to make some more pictures perhaps and the uh, the song is from another one of my favorite artists and the song is called midnight but for a ps a postscript to the show i've uh, i've chosen a quote to do with belief which i i hope sums up the the last couple of weeks of this really um i love this it's from george Eliot. it's never too late to be who you might have been The Photo Walk is a Loading Zone production.